welcome to Six Pack Philosophy, where we take philosophy, mix it with beer, and apply it to the questions you deal with every day. Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy. I'm Anastasia, here with Mike and John, and this week we are discussing our impending future. As interchangeable bricks in the wall. Oh, so gloomy, so gloomy. <laughs> but before we get started, what are we drinking, guys? We are drinking Terrible. Terrible. From the Unibrew Brewing Company in Quebec, Canada. And this is a, a Belgian quadruple, so I really have high expectations of it. I hope it isn't what its name says. <laughs> Maybe it's like Ivan the Terrible, you know? It's not, it's not, uh, it's talking about its, it, it's, its power, its power there. Not, not so much so uh, that, it's, that it's bad. So open that up. Let's see what we got here. And while you're doing that, uh, we are doing the Industrial Revolution and uh, our, our, our impending doom, right? Yeah, the modern applications yeah. of, of Ooh, that, that one had a much better that, pop. That than one the did last sound one. good. That did sound good. Um, if things uh, are, are a little different, we have a we have a guest producer in the house today. If you listen to our New Year's Eve show, he was there for that one. Uh, yeah. Blaine is in the house for us. Are you there, Blaine? I am. Everything working good? Looking good over there? I think so. All right, all right. So Juggling. So. We are... Uh, go ahead and mute my mic real quick. I'm, I got to make an adjustment here. Go ahead. So we're going to go ahead and uh, pour this fine brew up. And uh, while John is fondling his mic over there, and I'm not talking about me, he fondled me earlier. So uh, We do that off the air. We, we do that off the air. Sometimes we do it on the air. You never know. You got to pay extra for that. You got to get in our Patreon account to see them, see John fondle me. Hey, Blaine, you, you want a, a bit of this beer? I got you. Like I a got silly you here. question. Well, go ahead, John, and start us into this. Yeah. So there, there was this very, I'm going to say, tumultuous period in history called the Industrial Revolution, where we saw a huge change in uh, the manufacturing side and, and how things were done, as well as the the consumer side and, and the way that people consumed goods. And uh, I, I want to start off. This is going to be a comparative show, kind of a, a then and now kind of thing. Uh, but um, I want to start off talking about then because it's really hard to, uh, for most people who aren't studied or didn't live there, which is very few these days. Very, very few. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's nobody. Yes. It's no, there's no Methuselahs left. Yeah. Um, um, but to, to kind of envision uh, what that meant to, to different groups of people. So I think that's a, a great place to, to start out. Um, I guess to, to start, uh, the Industrial Revolution uh, was a boom in innovation uh, driven by our ability to take energy, I'll say, in the form of steam, and a lot of that meant coal. Adjusting from from, uh, from manpower and animal power to, uh, to water power, steam power, coal power. Yeah, yeah. take that and... and and bend it to our will, I'll say, to to uh, mass produce a, a lot of the products that at one time were made by families, uh, single use, skilled craftsmen. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and and the fact that it's uh, you know that, that that doing that you know put a lot of people out of work and changed the economy globally. Uh, you know, it, it it had it has some far reaching effects. I mean, we we are much more comfortable now than we were then. <laughs> But but let's be honest. The the Luddites of that time period had a uh, you know had, had had a legitimate bitch. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you 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 brought up that group, the the Luddites, because a lot of people use that term nowadays for somebody who's opposed to technology in yeah, some way. I I, I I I jokingly refer to myself as a Luddite a lot of times. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of people I think have have this vision. At least I did for a while that it comes from some kind of Amish tradition, but it, it really doesn't. No, the, uh, the the Luddites, uh, and, and there's there is some uh, question about this stuff. It's named after a uh, an eighteenth century man who went around destroying all kinds of, of, of machinery as a form of protest because of uh, of losing jobs. Um, we know that, that 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 this person did exist, but we don't really know if that's where where the name came from. His name was Ned Ludd. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's there's all kinds of speculation that Ned Ludd could have actually been an amalgamation of men, and it might actually be uh, a nom de guerre, a name that that, that a bunch of people used uh, as they're doing this. It, it 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 led to this massive Luddite revolution, particularly in uh, in England, 
where where the people rose up they broke machinery it was it was so violent in the 17 and 1800s that at one point in 1810 the british government were, was was using uh had, had more soldiers in the field fighting the luddites than they had fighting napoleon um yeah, a lot of people who are critics of this period like to point out how violent industry got uh, against people. And I think there's some truth to that. Um, but there was really this back and forth where people working in factories would uh, kind of lash out against uh, factory owners in a very violent fashion. And the factory owners would respond. And then in, in, in the, the middle of, of all that, we saw occasionally... Uh, one side or the other would start to lose ground and uh, protest the government to come in and, and fix this. This is horrible. Well, you, when you had a situation where, you know, the Luddites would charge these private factories and, and destroy the machinery and the owners were shooting at them. We're talking, uh, you know, it, it, it was revolution. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it was it was. A weird form of civil war. It really was, uh, and but but that that very fact that that you know Napoleon was the greatest threat to to England of, of the modern era, without a doubt, Napoleon yeah. was the biggest threat they had, and yet at that time period they were they they were forced to put more soldiers on their homeland against their own people than they were against Napoleon on on, on the mainland. Uh, that that just that just amazes me, and you know the uh, the Luddite. Uh, uh, movement spread out of england it, you know it started there but it went into germany it went in uh well the holy roman empire at that time it wasn't, mm -hmm. wasn't called germany it was the german states uh it, you know it went into france uh we're going to see in the in, you know in the latter part of the 1800s there's a luddite movement right here in, in, in the united states yeah uh, and, and you know it, and it's never really died uh karl marx actually quotes the the luddite movement at one point as as one of the inspirations of his workers of the world unite movement uh so you know you've got these these ideas that were out there and the fact that 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 they were worried about losing the power of being a craftsman and being a worker to the evil management uh boy that sounds like something we would hear today mm -hmm. yeah i, I want to move off I, I think the luddites are fascinating i think we could probably get lost in an entire episode talking about uh, them, their their philosophies and and their their revolution. Sure, sure. But um, I, I don't think. And and Mike, you're more the expert on this. So tell me if you think I'm wrong. I don't think the Luddites were the main concern of the day to day Joe Nobody working class family. I think they saw a lot of changes in their own life that. Uh, kind of stole their concern away uh moving out of the farms uh the the different way in which they consumed goods and the different ways in which their jobs evolved e even for the people that weren't trying to get politically engaged they were just trying to work a i'm going to say nine to five but then it was probably a lot more like a, a nine yeah, to nine 12 hour days yeah, yeah, yeah. um but the way that their jobs changed, both for the good and, and the amount they could output in, in a short amount of time, and for the bad and in, in, in the psychological effects of um, kind of taking the craft out of a lot of well, the Well, taking the craft and taking taking the family farms out in a lot of ways. Yeah. You, you, you had things right here in our own country. We had uh, you know things like the McCormick Reaper that came out there uh, that, that went through and set up a system where – between 1836 and 1868, which is a, a pretty short period of time, yeah. 18, 1868, we went from uh, from in the farm what it took 18 men to do down to what one man could do. Yeah. Well, let's think about that for a minute. You put 17 men out of work. Mm -hmm. Now, at the same time, you created jobs for people to, to build these machine this machinery. You've, yeah. you've created some other jobs. But if you're not trained for that that new job, if you're trained to work in the farm by hand and all of a sudden you don't have a job, what do you do? Do you do you do you, do you rise up in revolution <laughs> or do you go through a retraining system? What, yeah. what do you do? Yeah. Well and, and beyond that, uh, the the farm owner saw impact as well because some of them who adopted the new methods, they thrived. They did really well, but for the ones who either refused to or uh, couldn't afford to adopt the new machinery, they had a few problems. All of a sudden, the price of the, their products started falling, and they weren't really seeing any change in, in their cost to produce these goods. So we, we saw uh, some people being displaced from the farm, 
uh, where they were they once had this large plot of land that they were able to make a living off of. It is no longer profitable for them to make a living off of the land. The land becomes an asset. So what they do, they, they sell it to somebody who can make a profit off of it because they've adopted this machinery. And then those people go through and they're able to lower the price even further. It creates this kind of cascade where, where farming is, is no longer a, a job of the common man and much more a job of industry. Well, it also creates that economic problem where while low prices are beneficial and we all want low prices, low prices are going to hurt somebody. Yeah. When prices go down, somebody gets hurt. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know uh, unless everything goes down equi- uh, you know, equivocally and, and, and wages in, in, end up offsetting it. And, uh, and, and they didn't. Uh, there, was a, there was a period of growing pains there. Where wages were not uh, not increasing at the level to keep up with the fact that unemployment was up, and uh, you, you know the the cost of some products, even management wasn't making as much money. Yeah. So uh, in response to this, a lot of the children of those those farm owners uh, move into the city. They realize there's there's no more future for them on the farms in the rural areas where they grew up. So at this time, we see a large influx of people in these cities. And a lot of these cities were not prepared for the influx of people they saw. And this created waste management problems. Sure. This created crowding problems. Uh, their streets weren't set up for it. Uh, it would be the equivalent of if, you know, we're in little bitty Jacksonville, Texas. I'm sure there are people all across the world listening to this who are in little bitty, you know, towns across Texas. But they're, they're full towns. You know, they have a city council and all this. And it would be the equivalent of if a large city's population suddenly flooded your town yeah. and you had Dallas level population in, in Jacksonville, Texas, it, it would be a disaster. People would be, uh, people who live there would be furious about all these people. Housing were, costs would go up dramatically. Absolutely. It would be like Mud National <clears throat> all yeah. the time. Sanitation problems would, would be there. You know, this is a time before. Uh, before sanitation was, was pulling the waste away in a lot of these towns and a lot of places the weight you know human waste just dumped in the streets now imagine yeah. if all of a sudden you know you you explode 10 times bigger and you have 10 times as many people doing that you have a real health problem yeah. epidemics were a problem yeah also uh, we saw a lot of these people who came from the farms and not just the farms but people who were crafts of their labor whether it be textile uh, or or woodworking or whatever that is, who are suddenly their job is not to to do a craft, is not to creatively work on these farms to fix the fence to work with the animals, but it's to monitor these machines. You sit there for twelve hours, you make sure these machines are running. If something goes wrong, you go through and you fix it. You, you, you may get a little creativity when something goes awry, but for the most part, you you sit there and do a, a much a more re- task. repetitive yeah, yeah, task. Repetitive task. Uh, you know, in, uh, I, I keep kind of kind of jumping back into history, but you know, Henry Ford when he came through and and uh, and, and mechanized the automotive industry and created, uh, but didn't create, but 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 specialized the, the assembly line in there. There was a uh, there was a saying that 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 was said, and you may have heard your your grandparents or great grandparents say it. Uh, my great grandfather used to say that all the time. It's time to put on your Ford face. And what he meant by that was was just suck it up and and, and deal with it. You know, it, it's it's you're not going to enjoy it, but you have to do it. And that's that that's what happened when you took men. That at one point, you know, four people would build a whole car, and yeah. now all of a sudden, your job is I put this bolt in this spot all day for twelve hours. Uh, I, I you know that's that's going to have a psychological effect on you. Yeah, well, and and you know anyone who who works in a, a middle upper class job, and and we'll be getting to you guys real soon. But it, any of you know, and and it's really hard thing to explain to to a, a blue collar worker who hasn't been there that that kind of work can be mentally exhausting, and whenever you switch from. Yeah, you were working 12 hours out in the farm, maybe 16, who knows. And you were doing that, but you were doing different stuff. You were putting out fires. You had a really purpose-driven job. And when you go from that to to a much more mundane job, all of a sudden 12 hours becomes uh, 
and humanly difficult. Yeah. Well, and, and, and just the fact that I think the human condition needs to see an end product. We need to see something, something being accomplished. And when you're a craftsman that that, that builds a gun, you, you know, where you take and you you know you, you you do the wood stock, you do everything. At the end of it, you have a product, and you can say, "I built this." But if your job is, I put the trigger assembly in this on an assembly line. You don't see a product. You don't see an end end, end result. Yeah. Uh, and 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 the end result, you can't say I did this. You can say we did this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a very communal thought. But but that's there, there's a different mentality. But you don't feel important. You don't feel you you feel like a cog. You don't, you don't feel ownership. Yeah. 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 And and you, you know and and that's purpose. that's a problem uh, in in today's society too. You hear that a lot. Of I don't I don't feel. Feel uh, ownership over my I want to work somewhere job. meaningful. I want to do something, something meaningful. meaningful. That's right. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Uh, I, I don't just want to be a cog in the machine. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so these were, were some of the issues that that were really uh, uh, drove uh, these revolutions we saw soon after the Industrial Revolution for workers' rights. Uh, I want to talk about the other side, though. Uh, some of the positives that came out, both immediately and long term. Um, so you talk about that craftsman who who made the gun versus the 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 factory worker who made a trigger assembly. Um, one downside to that that and and the military utilized this greatly, but one downside to the craftsman who made a gun is when that trigger broke. Oh, you, you had to have a craftsman come in and, and fix it. You couldn't yeah. you couldn't just order another trigger. Yeah, you you had to have him. And and maybe if he has some proprietary method, maybe there's a very small number of people who who know how to make. That Absolutely. kind of trigger. It was the original waiting period. Yeah, yeah. And, and and then the molds for, for that metal working. I mean, they that metal had to had to be either the mold had to be handmade or the metal had to be hand worked because that trigger didn't necessarily fit anything else. So there was a great amount of labor in replacing the gun to the point of yeah, the gun may be of high quality and last for a long time, but when it broke It was broke. You might as well just throw it away and go buy a new gun and, and it becomes problematic and, and it's wasteful really from, yeah, from yeah. a lot of material standpoint and, and the reason I, I i chose gun to talk about this is because that's really where the idea of interchangeable parts came out of you know eli whitney was was you know he's famous for the cotton gin but eli whitney's more important thing was he developed interchangeable parts and he yeah. did it because the military needed guns mass produced yeah you know mexican war was coming up we needed these things and and uh that that's why they they happened uh, one of those cases where the the military and necessity was the mother of invention here, and and today you know when something breaks you order a you, know, you go online you order the part and you fix it yeah and you do that because of this industrialized uh, production well I, I would argue that that was the way it was done in the nineties I would say today it's become so cheap and easy that we're back to that throw it away thing now we have recycling programs to put it back on but large amounts of equipment you. You just uh, industrial equipment. You were still in the, the replace in the in the replace apart mode, but for large amounts of equipment, your headphones go out. You could go buy a new new magnet and 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 everything to fix it, but, but it's don't. just it's just so cheap to just buy a new one. It's kind of the other side of that. Uh, it was so expensive to fix before that you, you you almost couldn't do it. Now you can do it, and it's real cheap. But and and it's still probably more expensive to replace the headphones, but your labor is so much more valuable to that part that you say it's not worth my time. I, my my labor is more valuable than than this set of headphones. I'll just buy a new set of headphones. I mean, that's kind of become the standard now. Phones, computers, all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. 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 Even expensive phones. I mean, uh, uh, you're you're talking about eight hundred dollars a piece, and you say yeah, but. It's still cheaper to just buy a new one, you know, yeah, yeah. and you get the latest technology, and so why not do it? Now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we also saw a rise in, um, I'm going to say, personal machinery. I'm talking about the Model T. I'm talking yeah. about some, some of these agricultural implements, not the big ones that you saw in the fact in in, in the uh, in the the, the mass-produced farms, but it, you could afford much smaller versions of these that made your your home farm cheaper and easier you no longer had to get the mule to pull the plow you could get a a, a much smaller uh, uh scale you know a, a steam engine to pull that plow uh, you're looking at me funny like oh i was just i i i'm going down memory lane here uh chase a little rabbit when, when, when my wife and i first started dating her grandfather was still alive and, and he was born in 1910 and uh 
first time I went out to the house, he was in the backyard in the garden and he was plowing with a mule. Uh, he had a tractor, but he thought the mule did a better job. So I thought oh, wow. I'd share that with you. <laughs> the tractor was for big jobs. Come on. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. But I, I think there was probably a lot of sentiment like that in the time where, where they were trying to hold hard and fast to their roots, the things that they, their grandfathers, their great grandfathers. You know, this is a, a time when we really start to see the takeoff of this uh, exponential growth. And, and we're talking about changing the thing, the way things have been done for tens, if not hundreds of generations. And now all of a sudden tomorrow, it's that history is, is all but gone. Yeah, we've lost it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that that's a quick overview of the Industrial Revolution, I, I think, is there any other big historical points that we've kind of missed in this discussion? You know, that there's one, but I, I, I think if uh, if y'all are okay with it, I'd like to do a hard shot on it, about a 10 or 15 minute hard shot when we get through with okay, this. Okay, you, you, you want to tell us a little bit about it? I want to talk about a guy named Samuel Slater, a guy that, uh, that in America we called the father of the Industrial Revolution. In England, they called him Slater the Traitor. Okay. And kind uh, of kind of tease that one. And, and, All right. Um, it, it it relates to this, but it's it's kind of its own thing. Okay, so if you want to hear about Samuel Slater, uh, go over to uh, Heart Shots. It's going to be on YouTube, and uh, it's going to be enlisted. So if you want to get the link to that video, you're going to have to become a Patreon. Yep. Patreon.com slash Six Pack Philosophy. Okay, I know it's a little bit early in the show from what we usually do, but... I think it's a good break. It's a good point. natural stop. So let's uh, let's let's talk about this uh, this this brew here. Let's do it. Who wants to start this one? Um, I did the last you one. Mike. Did you want me to start this one? Yeah. All right. What exactly kind of beer is this supposed to be, John? It's a Belgian quadruple. quadruple. Uh-huh. Uh huh. It, it it's a heavy beer. Yeah. Uh, I I like the uh, I really like the front end taste. It's got a. a kind of bitterness there on the front end that I really like. The smell is fantastic. The smell is great. I'm going to give it one big hit, and the, the hit is that it's it's gone immediately. There's mm -hmm. no aftertaste for it. And I'm always <laughs> looking for that bell curve. I, you know, I want, I want that flavor to come in softly, rise up, feel your mouth, get this good feeling, and then kind of slowly go away and you can feel it. This is, uh, you know, it, 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 it comes in very abruptly. It's strong, and then it just falls off. Uh, yes, yes. And, and I think some people are going to like that. I'm, I'm not one of those. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to hit it on that. Um, it's uh, there's, there's there's some kind of a of, of a citrusy or a fruity overtone mm. in there. I'm not I'm not sure what it is. Like a berry is what, what? See, I was tasting something more like dates almost. There, well, there's something fruity like in there, and I can't I can't pull out what it is. Mm -hmm. And I like that. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the the head on it had a good flavor to it, mm -hmm. and that's not that's not always always the case here. I think if they did a, an admirable job on this beer, I don't think it is a great beer. Yeah. But I think it's a good beer. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it easily makes the benchmark for, for, for what we're doing. I think it easily hits that 2-5 that, that level, but I don't think it goes much beyond that. So I'm going to uh, I, I'm going to try and be, be, be fair here. Uh, I'm going to go with a 2-6 on this beer. Okay. Anna? Um, so I'm going with a 3.1. <laughs> um, I think this is a well-made beer. Um a quadruple is intended to have a much more robust flavor. Um, the the date flavor that I, I'm picking up in there um, is something that I don't recognize from a lot of beers, and I find that to be really pleasant, but it's not overly sweet. There's something in there that's kind of balancing it out. I don't know. I, I'm not picking up exactly what that is, but I do really like it. Um, so that's why it gets a 3.1 from me. I'm really torn on this beer, and I'll, I'll tell you why. If I take a drink, and I'm not going to do it now, um, but if I take a drink... I, I'll do it for you. Yeah. I hold it in my mouth, and I just kind of swirl it around and enjoy the flavor, maybe breathe some air through that and, and get it in my sinus cavity. This is a great beer. This is like a, a 3.7, a 3. This is a really good beer. However, that's not how most people drink a beer. They pull it in their mouth, they taste it for a little while, and they swallow it. And like you said... Uh, the flavor has gone so quickly. I even feel, I, I feel the carbonation lasting on my tongue longer than I feel the flavor last. That, that, that bubbly peroxide, uh, kind of feel lingers a little bit longer than the taste itself. And, um. That's a big hit though. It is. It is a big hit. And when I, when I consider that, it, 
it goes all lower. So what do I do? Do I rate it on, on, on this really kind of uh, optimum thing that I can give it where I can hold it in my mouth and have a good experience? Or do I rate it on how you just drink a beer? And, and I think we need to go a little bit more toward how you're just going to drink a beer. And if, if I'm looking at how you're just going to drink a beer, it, it, uh, it, it pulls it down. I'm going to say it, it, it pulls it down below the two five. However, I, um, I'm not going to hit it that low because it, it does have something really good in there. You just kind of got to weed it out. So I'm going to go with a two eight. Okay. So we got a two six, a two eight, and a three one. Mm -hmm. That's 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 it's an admirable beer. Yeah, yeah. it it's is an admirable beer. It does is. our does our producer want to want to chime in and tell us what he thinks? Yeah, I'm I'm probably going to give it a two three. Oh boy! I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of with John. I don't really know. I don't mean this root. I don't know what setting you would drink this. This is definitely something you drink out of like a brandy snifter or something. It's something you kind of sip. It's it's I like heavy beer. That's pretty heavy. It does taste good. It kind of dies off fast, but it's it's a pretty heavy beer. All right, so that's a personal thing though. All right, well, it just sounds like you're right there in the ballpark with us. Now let's go to the important questions here. Uh, uh, you, you know, let's start with you, Anna. Uh, this beer going to get you laid? Uh, really, probably not. Uh, it, it's not going to be the thing that seals the deal. It's also not going to. Um, it, it's not going to prohibit you. Well, does this sway your opinion at all that it's a 10.5 ABV? <laughs> does that help the getting laid part at all? Yeah, I knew that was coming. Um, not in a good way. <laughs> in a, a dangerous way. It's a you know, Bill Cosby kind of yeah. way. This, yeah, this, exactly. This one might get you laid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, John? What, what, what date? You know, I'm... This would be one I'd try with anybody. I mean, I saw it at the store. I talked about it in the last show how excited I was about the new... This is one of the beers I was really excited about. I would buy it and say, let's try this together. However, having tried it, I wouldn't then say, hey, I got this great beer on a date. It, it'd be something I'd try with anybody. So I find myself in a really difficult place of... of it's it's got a, a great bottle. We talked about the bottle. This has a, a an awesome design. It looks good. It's quadruple. I had really high expectations on it, but having tried it now, I uh, I'd leave it off the list unless we are going somewhere to get a flight. I'd include it in the flight so we can try different things. But yeah, I think just, it would be a great flight beer. I, I'm yeah. not going to try and impress anybody with this. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know. Okay. Uh, not a lawnmower beer. Not a lawnmower oh, beer at all. It's, it, it's it's too heavy for that. And on the other side, while it's it, it's too heavy to be a lawnmower beer, and the fact that the the flavor drops off so quick, yeah. it's really too light to be. Uh, you know, the I'm going to sit outside and you know get plastered and, and and watch the sunset beer. So I don't I don't know where it fits. Yeah, you, you're you're not going to have. Uh, well, I say that it's kind of alcohol for you to have this this awesome nice night with the boys that you always think back and you know that was a great night, but. You're not gonna. You're not gonna. When you think back on that night, say, "You remember that beer we had? That was a great." You're, that's not gonna be part of the memory or experience. You're gonna be like, "Remember that one time we got really drunk?" Yeah, yeah. You know, like three what, beers. What was that yeah. beer? I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it was terrible. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so they named it well. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't think there would be a night to look back on. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that, that, that's 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 quite possible. Yeah. All right, so. We have covered this beer, and uh, it didn't do as well as I thought it was going to do. Yeah, I, I really didn't. I really expected uh, uh, the, the two of you to be a, be higher than you were. Uh, I because uh, I struggled with, with with rating that one. I, I was a little surprised. Where are we going to next year? Okay, John? so so we've kind of laid out a foundation for the industrial revolution, and and I said this podcast was going to be a comparative look. So what we're comparing now is it, it kind of feels like we're going through something very similar right now. With the advent of... Um, Everything. Yeah, computers, AI, neural networks, all of this. And and the, the main difference that we're seeing is we are no longer looking at displacing the blue-collar worker. We're looking at displacing the upper-middle-class white-collar worker in a very similar fashion that we did... <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to uh, uh, it during the Industrial Revolution... There's actually been a. I, I struggled on what to name the show, and I finally settled on on both names. Uh, we'll see if that sticks. But I, I'm um, versus replaceable people because that, that's really what we're talking about here. Versus the name that it's been given of automation and anxiety. 
Um, and, and, and that's become a, a kind of a, a psychological thing that people are, 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 or it's just, uh, yeah, uh, it, it, is it, it psychological is. or would it be a, a so sociological? I don't know. I don't know, but, but it, it's, it's a real thing that, that people are running into. I want to talk about a, a little bit of the history on how we, how we got to this place. Um, there was this guy, and I'm probably going to mispronounce this name, uh, Genichi uh, Taguchi. And he started uh, developing this thing called the Taguchi loss function. It's, it's a really big idea, uh, even today, in um, uh, uh, industrialization. And what the Taguchi loss function tells us about is um, uh, changing in process parameters. So, for instance... Um, at one time we used what was called the goalpost method where we took and we drew two lines and we said, um, we have to keep our process parameters between line A and line B. And whenever, whenever process parameters go out of line A and line B, we need to adjust them back into, to that. I'm sorry. Are we hearing like this weird echo? I'm hearing some kind yeah, of an echo. Yeah, it's out of Blaine's there. headphones. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. There's All right, that's what it is. There's a button on the side if you need to turn it down, Blaine. Okay. All right. So, Go ahead. Sorry about that. Anyway, it was it was throwing me off. Okay. So w when we have this uh, this 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 goalpost method, whenever our, our process parameters get out of those two lines, uh, we we instantly say, well, let's bring it back into two lines. Well, what what Tamaguchi started to realize is there's no reason to wait to react until uh, our process parameters hit that point. Why don't we wait and see when our process parameters first start drifting? And when they first start drifting, we correct them and make those two goalposts, make those like the red zone. Like we have, have gone into like DEFCON 9 over here. Um, and and he, he starts developing this. And actually one of the very first companies um, to adopt these procedures is Toyota, the, the car manufacturer we still see today. Now we, we know, uh, uh, now any stock trader is going to know that the, the, the company ends up expanding, making more than cars, but that, that's what they're most known for. Um, later on after Toyota, it kind of comes through and blows the other car industries out of the water with, with its speed in which it comes up and becomes a huge player in the game from, from zero to hero. Um, this guy named Mike Rother comes through and he's an American researcher and he's, he has worked some with the Toyota people and he says, why were they able to take over this industry so quickly? And he writes a book called Toyota Kata in which he, he explores um, Toyota's um, manufacturing processes and set and, and start starts looking at how they were able to do that. And what he comes to is this idea of one standardized work so we're talking about uh, uh, skilled white collar people here and and uh, 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 workers everybody from from the engineers to the CEOs down to the people on the floor have a checklist have a standard a b c d screw in the screw move the part to the left grab the part on the right move it in that they do maybe the engineer is every day at one o'clock you make a round around the factory. That'll take about 30 minutes. You observe what's going on. You take a time study on, on one part of the factory that rotates through, and you see which part took the longest. Maybe the CEO is, at at, at 8 a.m., I, I check our stock numbers. At 9 a.m., I write a report on what has happened. Last, you know, everybody has this very standard set of labor they do. And then what we do, after we standardize that set of labor, we do these time studies, and we say, well, what took the longest? Was it moving the part to the left or was it moving the part in? Oh, moving the part in took a little longer? Why don't we do this? Why don't we, we compress the factory? Uh, there's actually an extra inch in between them and the part that's taken up. We'll make the factory a little bit smaller so there's there's a, less of an inch to have to move. Okay, well, screwing the screw in took a little longer. That's because we're using a one and three quarter inch screw and that extra, that extra three quarters took time. So we're gonna use a one inch screw because it, it works just as well in this part. And we're going to start whittling away at these little time You bits. take a second here and a second there. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And you, you do that every week. You take a second off. And eventually, you're saving minutes and hours doing this. Uh, and, and Toyota, this, this really plays into a lot of the Japanese and, and Eastern culture stuff we've looked at. 
they're not trying to take a quarterly look like a lot of the Western companies are at where their stock is that quarter. They're saying, where's our company going to be in 100 years? Because they realize a second a week over 100 years is, is huge. Mm -hmm. and, and they're taking this very long, long-term approach on, on their companies. This also leads to, to uh, what's called a decision tree, right? So the decision tree says, okay, you move your part to the fr from, from the right, you put in a screw, you move to the left. What happens when the screw doesn't go in? Well, you, reach, you look over behind you and there's a book. Did it go in halfway? Did it not go in at all? You find what happened. Okay, this happened. Uh, was the screw shaped correctly? Yes. And you follow these decision trees and it says, your solution is do this. Throw the part away. Your solution is uh, check your screw supplier. Your solution is whatever. Okay. And there is a part by part solution. Well, I look at that as an engineer and someone who writes programs and I say, wait, we've written a program for people. We've taken people and we've turned them into computers and we've said, execute this program for us. Um, we've, we've kind of taken in a certain amount, we've objectified people, we've taken their humanity away. And, uh, this, this is in, in some ways great. Everybody has to create the product in the exact same way every time. Yeah. And in some ways this is great. I, I know people that, that went into the military because the military kind of uh, did a lot yeah, of this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and they loved it. They said, oh, I didn't have to pick what I was going to wear that day. I, I knew what my day was going to be like. There, there was very little anxiety from that. But I think there's another side to that. The other side is you feel like you lost your humanity. Uh, a lot of people. You have to find a way to secure your humanity elsewhere. Yeah, a lot of people uh, uh, late in life go on, on what's called these, um, uh, 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 they try and build a monument. I, I forget what the term is, but they, they want to be remembered later on. And I'm sorry, the guy who executes the program for the factory every day for the rest of his life will not be remembered. He is a cog yeah, in a machine. Yeah, yeah. The guy who maybe the general will be remembered in the military, but the, the private first class who, who went and did his job, cooked the, 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 the chicken fettuccine the same way every day on the, on the, um, uh, 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 Pearl, on, during Pearl Harbor, he, he's at the bottom of the sea. Nobody knows who that guy yeah. is. You know, we put his name on a memorial and we move on. And I, I think that creates a certain amount of anxiety, that kind of acceptance that you – are not only unimportant, but you are unimportant by design. You 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 have no aspirations of importance because anything that you did that was unique to you, that was different from anyone else, you've become a person that can be picked up and, and anyone else can be dropped in in your place. Well, and I think the thing that is the source of the anxiety there is that I think for most people, if they examine their impact on the world, their impact on the universe would realize that their existence doesn't mean shit. Mine does. No, it doesn't. Um, but their existence doesn't she just, matter. She just said, no, it doesn't to me. What the hell is that? It doesn't mean anything. And I think I'm important. We know. My and mama told that's me, why you're on a podcast. My mama told me I was important and I could be anything I wanted to be. Yeah. I became an asshole. So whenever something you end up acting out on a smaller scale day to day to day, the exact same position that you hold in the greater universe, um, <coughs> I, I can absolutely see why that causes people distress. It kind of it does. forces them to take a look at, at their place in the universe where they may have if they were a craftsman and they were there, they're having to utilize their minds and their hands and their bodies to put something together. They're having to put a lot of mental and physical energy into it that is not allowing them to really critically look at who they are when it, it comes to have, everything else. Have, have you ever, ever felt this experience where, where something has happened to you like this and, and you feel like you know this this lonesomeness because yeah because you're not there has that happened to you in your job at some point i'm, oh, I'm yeah. just curious mm -hmm. because uh you, you know a couple of years ago the school district i work in and, and, and teaching is, is one of those jobs that i always thought is a secure job you're mm -hmm. always going to need teachers but uh you know we had a situation where our spanish teacher quit and we 
went and bought a program on the computer and I was proctoring. And the next thing I know, we had all these kids dumped in and I had a time period of the day where I had a kid doing chemistry. I had a kid doing Spanish. I had a kid doing physics. I had all these kids and they were all on the computer getting this stuff. And I was not teaching. I was mm -hmm. proctoring. They could have taken me out and put the lunch lady in there and, they, you know, and, and, and paid somebody a whole lot less to do it. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I can tell you the, the same thing. I'm, I'm at a real paradoxical place in my job because I'm an engineer. I went to engineering school and I know this is the most efficient way to do things. I, I've read the material. I've read the books. And yes, I agree. It works. And my job is to make the process efficient. Yet in making the process efficient, I, I, I do a, a, a certain uh, disservice. It, it's kind of like the, uh, the, the, the person in society who, who comes to that realization that the best thing you can do for society is remove yourself. And it's like, well, where, where do my, my loyalties lie? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I end up developing standard work and, and all this stuff. Now, I know I'm doing this to others, too, but, but it's, it's even my job. It's developing the, the processes and procedures of my own job uh, to the point where they can pluck me out and drop someone else in. And, and, and there's kind of a paradoxical nature. You know, to, it, it's funny that, that you bring that up because, uh, you know, right here on this show, we've done something similar to that. Uh, very recently, you know, mm -hmm. we've, yeah. we've gone through and put in some some standard procedures that that you follow. So, you know, even Blaine can run the producing pr production <laughs> over there. So, yeah. uh, I don't know about that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but, uh, but 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 you know that's that that's we are we are putting we are doing the same thing that that Toyota did and Henry Ford did right here on a, on, on a little podcast. Yeah, well, and and, and it worked. It, it it beautifully did what it was intended to do because we we developed the standard process now we were actually supposed to meet earlier today we we're going to discuss kind of what we developed and our producer was sick he couldn't make it we called in we called in blaine we we had, we knew blaine was in town and we said hey blaine can you come do this and he went through the checklist and he did all the things and we were able to just drop someone else in, in in the spot, and it worked really well for the show. So if this show doesn't suck, it's because the system worked. You know, well, and, if and, you're listening to it now, it's because the system worked. And, and that's actually a key point to all this: that when something doesn't work right, you don't say, "Well, you're a shitty person; you didn't do your job right." You yeah. say, "Our system's broken. Let's fix the system." And when it works really, really well, you say, "We have a great system. Let's improve it." So it, it actually. You know, there's kind of two sides of it. It it takes the 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 gratitude and the um, satisfaction. The, the well, not the satisfaction, the but art. the art, the kudos away from the people. But it also takes the blame away. Mm -hmm. That wasn't your fault. Did you did you follow the system? Yes. Okay. Well, then the system was broken. Did you not follow the system? No. Well, why didn't you follow the system? Well, I thought this was better. You know, we need to train you better. We we need to to train mm -hmm. you better. That the best thing is to follow the system. Yeah. Yeah. And and it really does get to I can drop anyone here. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that and that's actually currently my job at the place that I work at right now. We're contracting for larger companies, and they will drop me in a position to write up a process, and they know how good a job I do by how fast I work myself out of work. <laughs> it's, it's literally I'm there to work myself out of a position, Ouch. to build a system that's uh, self checking to where. They just it just runs. So, and a lot of companies are doing that now. Sure, sure, and it, and and, it, and it's going to create uh um, it's going to create a little bit a little bit of uh, uh a, I don't know what the word was uh, discomfort. That's the word yeah, I'm looking for. Yeah, it, it does, it does. I want to take the programming people aspect of this. I want to put it on a back burner. We're going to come back to it and talk about those people that are being programmed here in a little bit. <laughs> but there's another branch of this that I think uh, deserves a little bit of talking about, and that is. In certain cases, we're not, we're not even programming the people. We're writing a program for a computer and replacing the people. We're saying, well, the people aren't even necessary, and computers don't get sick. So, sorry. You know? Um, I don't know. I, I was, they do get viruses. I'm just saying. Some computer called in sick the other day, and you got sent to Mexico. Well, I mean, but that's fine. But what we can do, and, and we hadn't set this up for, for that situation, yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah. You can clone the computer, and when the computer gets sick, you destroy that computer, and you boot up a new one, yeah. and you drop it in its place. Yeah. Now, but, my job still exists because every once in a while that didn't go right, and i got to go to Mexico to fix it. But I don't know that that's going to be a forever thing. Yeah. I mean, it's working yeah. better and better at this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I was reading an article on this, and, and it was talking about automation. And 
it said that 40% of workers, sorry, 47% of workers' jobs are potentially at risk of automation. Mm -hmm. Has anybody been to Walmart here lately? Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome, by the way. (laughs) So I went, because I went there, and and actually I, I went there with my mom, and she knows one of the managers there. And so we tried out the the scan and go uh, yesterday, and what, when we were standing there in line, the manager that mom knows came over and said, "Hey, how'd you like it?" And my mom was confused. She said, "How are you going to stop people from stealing?" It's so easy because we just you basically scan your items, put them in your own bag, then you go up to the self checkout, scan the checkout, and it tells you how much you owe. And when she asked the manager about how they're going to stop from stealing. She said, well, in one of their, their district meetings that they had, uh, they decided that for every, if the system works, for every person that they, they pay twenty thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year that they're going to be removing, that the, the, uh, loss, the loss for people stealing would be potentially less for every person. They, so if a person stole $5,000 to every $20,000 person they fired, they're still profiting $15,000 selling the exact same items, doing the exact same thing. I'm sure there's some, some technicians they have to hire to make sure the, sheen, the machines work, but they're far less than the, the people just sitting there at the checkout. Yeah. So, I mean, that's already starting. That's in, this is in Jacksonville. Yeah, so. yeah. well, and the other thing that they can, they can do... Well, we don't have to get into too many detail there. T- details there, but there's technology that can be implemented um, so that an item that goes out that hasn't been paid for um, triggers an alarm. Much like the magnetic ones that we see on some of the higher yeah, ticket yeah. items, you know, just do that on literally everything, and then you need a handful of people to keep people from walking out of the store with shit. Well, and it, I, I promise you, it will not be too long. <laughs> Before they develop neural networks that can monitor those cameras and look for signs from people that they might be stealing. They're putting an item in their pocket. They can identify the items. They can identify the people. And they see them put an item in their pocket. And they walk out. And they're not even going to sound an alarm. They're going to take a picture. They're going to upload it against a database. They're going to find their Facebook profile. They're going to send it to the cops with a video of them doing it. And the cops are just going to show up at their house. Yeah. Yeah. I figure, I figure the time's coming where, where, where you'll just walk through the store Put the stuff in your buggy and 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 walk out, and it'll charge you for it. Yeah, I actually, they're... I actually ha- have a much better idea that I've been pushing. Nobody's adopted it yet. They ought to make a store where you you go into it. They have a bar slash restaurant. You sit down at the bar slash restaurant. You order their food, and they have a little kiosk or a, a, a screen, and you get your items. You go shopping, yeah. Yeah, and you sit there. You have your food. People in the back gather all your items. Your meal is done. You go out to your car. They load it up for you. You drive off. You never even had to go into the warehouse. And you paid for food and drinks while you're there. It's a good system. That's a good system. Yeah. Um, they, they need to adopt it. I want to name off some of these jobs that are at risk for automation. Drivers. Taxi and delivery drivers. If you drive a vehicle, you better learn to do something else. Well, even even uh, you know long haul drivers. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Uh, well, and with that comes pilots and drivers of other kinds of vehicles like boats. Um, this one shocked me a little bit until I thought about it. Uh, office support. So receptionists, I, I kind of get. Security. Security. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cameras. Yeah. Well, not just cameras. I actually saw one the other day where they had a robot that they had built. Now, it, it ends up crashing itself into a water fountain and makes a big joke. But don't laugh too hard because all those failures add up to an eventual success. Mm-hmm. It roams around and it, it has a camera on it. It doesn't use any force. It takes pictures. It looks for suspicious activity. It communicates with people. But when you really think about it, fighting people is like the very... The it's rare last, occasion, last yeah. Step, yeah. yeah, is the rare occasion of security job, and and half the time is is uh, an unjustified use of force, yeah. whereas a computer doing it can do all the other functionaries of your job, call the cops later for the force, <clears throat> and on top of that, you never have to worry about the liability of an unjustified use of force from a security guard. Yeah, we actually already have those in our office park in Dallas. Mm-hmm. They they roam they roam the parking lots already. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, sales and service. So cashiers, retail clerks, telemarketers, accountants. We were already seeing this. I mean, the the days when you talk to a real person on the phone are 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 getting fewer and far between. Yeah, and how many people do, do, do go to the accountant to get their taxes done anymore? Right. I, I use TurboTax. This was this one was was interesting. I hadn't thought about it, but it made sense. Paralegal work. So when a lot of par paralegal work, you'll say, I got this case where I need to, to my client uh, has a, a patent and there's this opposing patent and we need to know how to address it. Well, normally a paralegal would go through and search the law and search case history and find out supporting facts. Well, they just plug into a computer and a computer will go through, find all the supporting facts. Mm -hmm. And then it's up to a lawyer to put the case together. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you used to have to flip through actual law books. Now, I mean, we've seen this ourselves, searching through Texas election code, I mean, is simple. Control F. Well, yeah, and, exactly. And, you know, beyond it's that, think about, think about the number of, of boilerplate contracts that paralegals fill out. I oh, mean, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. you, know, you, you, you don't need somebody to do that. They're no, boilerplate. Exactly. Yeah. Find and replace. Yeah, well, and, and I think that's a good point that you made because... There's two steps to this. There's one is the one we're focusing on now of programming the program, but a, 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 a step to this that had to happen that I don't think anyone saw and was like, oh, this is going to gonna fire me one day, was making the contract a boilerplate. First building the boilerplate contract, they were like, oh, look, I realize that 70% of these are the same. I'm just going to write one I can fill in later. Nobody, when they were doing that, was like... And one day I'm going to get fired because mm -hmm. this was made. They were like, this is great. My job's easier. Yeah. <clears throat> so those are interesting. I have a quote here. Um, I, I thought it was really um, revealing uh, of, of the problems we're facing and how this, this is not something new. This is from John F. Uh, Kennedy. Um, he declared that the major domestic challenge of the 1960s was to, and I quote, maintain full employment at a time when automation is replacing men. When in reality, the, the thing that he should have been worried about was a bullet. Well, Damn, Mike. I, I just want to throw that out there. Well, uh, yeah. Maintaining. You want to shoot it out there? Maintaining yeah, there surveillance in Mexico. You know, all of these things. Yeah, they, they yep. were they were important aspects for his life um, or death. <laughs> so, so. I think that that section, the the fact of people's jobs getting automated is, is fairly straightforward. I don't see any way that, that train stops at this point. I, I think the technology is out there and it's gonna happen. I don't sure, sure. I don't see it's the natural evolution of things. Yeah, and, and I think new economies are gonna have to develop around that and, and, and we'll talk about what those may look like here in a second. Um, is is there any hope for anybody out there who's who's spent, let, let's say, uh, uh, 30 years in, in, in the industry as a driver, and they're at that weird place where I want to retire from this job, I don't want to start over at this point, but on the other hand, this is coming, or are they just kind of screwed? Nothing. They're not screwed, because there are things that they've learned. If you're looking at it from a really shallow perspective, yes, they are good with directions, they know how to drive, they've got a great driving record. But there is so much else that you, so many other skills that you develop while you're doing those jobs. And I think that's the key to this whole thing is as technology is developing, and stop me if I'm going somewhere that you're going to be going uh -huh. later, but as technology is developing, you have to be able to think about the things that you're doing from the perspective of not just how it is that you are completing the task that you're assigned, but how the thought processes that it takes, the skills that you're developing will fill other needs later. Um, you know, you're a driver, you, um, maybe you are an Uber driver and that job goes out the window. Well, you have developed, um, great interpersonal skills, you know, you, uh, Trying to think off the top of my head, but there are any number of things. Scheduling. Scheduling, yeah. absolutely. Um, you are self driven. That was, a, that was, that was a really good, good <laughs> yeah. choice. Good play on words. Too. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you have to uh, really push yourself and, and be self motivated. And that's huge. So much of the, the, new types of work that I'm seeing require people to be self-motivated. 
And that's exactly the sort of thing that employers are going to be looking for a lot well, more, I think. I think I think the new paradigm is going to be, and, and, and I don't even know if it's a new paradigm, although it's become much more, more uh, obvious, is that you've got to constantly be retraining yourself. Yeah. You've yeah. got to always be learning something. Uh, you know, I... Whenever we first got into this stuff, one of the things that I did is I went and got a lynda.com account. And I don't know how much stuff I've taught myself just because I want to go uh, right. to learn something. Because I feel like I, I have to I have to stay on the, the edge of some of this stuff, mm -hmm. you know. And I know uh, I, I think John used some of that stuff to learn how to how to how to record and produce some of this stuff. Yeah. You, you know, you, you've got to you've got to be be a self-taught person. Mm -hmm. And. That's something that, that that we need to to teach people because people are not self are, are, are self motivated with that kind of stuff. Yeah, you, you kind of hit on something I was going to respond with and say I think that what you're saying is great for the the person who has done that, but I think the person who learned to drive and was like, well, this is great. I I can I have a career now, and sat on their laurels. I think they are screwed. I, I think, think they're going to have trouble. Yeah. Yeah. And they're going to have to do retraining somewhere. Yeah. Uh, of some kind. But I, I think for the person who has taken the continual improvement, uh, 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 change in manufacturing that has occurred, and whether intentionally or just through their own curiosity, apply that to their life, a continuing improvement mantra to their life, I think they're fine. Um, I hope they're fine. I yeah. think the other people can be, but it's going to require changing your perspective. Got to be flexible. And maybe that's going to be in uh, a new job field that we see um, starting to develop is people whose job it is to identify um, identify people to fill new roles. Um, and And so looking at the factory worker and identifying skills they may have developed that they didn't realize that they were developing and picking them up saying, these are the skills that we expect that you've, you've uh, developed while you've been doing this, maybe testing them out on it and saying, Hey guys, I think you want to, you want to hire like a, a new version of the headhunter. Yeah. Uh, I, I honestly don't know why headhunter hasn't been more automated already the only argument I can see for why they're still around is maybe the selling point of, guys, you got to apply for this job. It's really great. I don't think computers are really great at motivating people, and maybe yeah. it's that motivational aspect. But as far as identification, I, I can't imagine people are doing mm -hmm. that better than computers at this point. No, sometimes it's, sometimes it's who you know, though. So uh, sometimes, you know, the, yeah. In, 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 in real specific fields, I could see where that could that could be effective. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, so, so that's kind of wrapping up the, the, the full automation aspect. Uh, I do want to talk about people because I have a general belief, maybe some share it, maybe others don't, that people are generally efficient machines. They they move in ways that are most efficient for their situation. You have obviously never taught junior high. I meant, I meant full people. Oh, not, full people. Yeah, okay. those are those are people in training. H half people are not efficient. Well, I, yes. maybe they're not efficient at, at optimizing your life. But they, <laughs> they're having fun with it. Well, that's true. That's you true. Know? They're they're real efficient at what they they want to do. Yeah, exactly. So, hold on, people are efficient machines and and going about things in the most efficient way possible. Yeah. All right. I don't want to hear your shit about my driving anymore you, and the routes that i choose you are you are real efficient at doing what you want to do at at going fast <laughs> which is what you want to do and but my routes are those also efficient they allow you more space for fast going because they're not the shortest distance mm -hmm. um, you and i probably drive the same way i don't speed i've ridden with you i know better much. <laughs> so you didn't let me finish. Right? <laughs> I've ridden with you more than once. I know how fast you drive. So uh, what I want to talk about here is, is we've had this conversation and I think we would probably do a hard shot or maybe even a whole show on this, but I want to, <clears throat> I want to touch on traits of millennials because we've really seen a change in the way millennials approach the workforce lazy fuckers yeah lazy fuckers that's right no, uh, i'm kidding but but we've, we've <laughs> not 
we've seen a change in the way they approach the workforce. And I want to ask the question, are they really, as you say, lazy fuckers? <laughs> or is there something uh, more substantive that they have identified in the way that the economy is moving, that they're adapting to in, in the way they do things? Yeah. I, I, I do think that they're, they think differently, uh, yeah. but, but I think you have to. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So I want to go through some of the traits that have been identified by um, researchers in, in looking at them. Uh, first of all, and this would seem obvious from all the conversations we've just had, they're the most educated generation. More of them go to college, more of them go to college longer. Uh, for the ones who don't go to college, more of them have high school degrees. They're the most educated generation. I don't know if there's really anything to uh, to discuss there, but it, it would seem like an obvious change for the way the workforce is changing. See, and, and, and when I look at that, I, I, I wonder about that more educated. I would say that they are they are differently educated, without a doubt, because I think there's there's different, le different kinds of education, you know. Uh, I'm much more educated than my grandfather was, but my grandfather could rip a uh, could could rip a uh, uh, engine apart and put it back together. I couldn't do that. Yeah, they're much more. F they have more formal, more formal education. Formal education. Yeah. 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 And yeah. and I think that 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 apprenticeship mindset, while it was an education, and I'm not going to deny yeah. that. Uh, I think that that when you see the shift to formal education, it has to do with the the lack of availability of the apprenticeship. Yeah, yeah, I think education. I think you're right. Yeah. I think you're right. But I, I just I I, yeah. I I don't want to seem like we're saying that that's not an education. Yeah, like like the other generations were stupid. Yeah. And and I'm a I'm a firm believer that that humans don't change much from one generation to the other. It's just they're in a the different situation. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I don't think that they have any more drive to be smart. I think they were in this situation where formal education was the necessity. Well, and there's a vast difference between education and intelligence. Right. Um, and even amount of things that you know. Education is um, a process. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another aspect of them and and i i really think this is one that that kind of hits on this automation um uh culture that we're, we're creating they're job hoppers damn right very few of them stay at jobs for a long time i'm actually a, a already a rarity and i've i've been at my job what, what seven uh, years seven years now yeah eight um years. yeah seven or eight something like that i don't remember but um i'm i'm a rarity in this in this whole thing and um yeah the days of, of of you know getting a job and staying there for 30 years are are in the past mm -hmm. and and i sometimes question my decision to stay there because i've looked at the numbers and the job hoppers make more money than i do yeah um now i have some stability gain that i have i also have a situation where uh, uh the mistress my wife is going through school and that stability kind of affords me benefits so so some of that is 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 active decision on my part to say I'm going to to put on my Ford face and 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 go through this, uh, but on the other hand, um, that's that's not uh, kind of where people are going, and I think part of that is driven. You know, we we have this household where you know one of us got educated, and now the other one's going through, and 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 the first one's paying for it, uh, which is it's it's kind of an older idea, but a lot of uh, uh, people of this generation, and this kind of ties into careers, are going through staying at home for longer getting educated and marrying later yeah. after all that's done. Yeah. Well, and and I think one of the things that makes your situation a little bit less of an oddity mm -hmm. is, um, yes, if you're looking at it, um, you could be making, according to the numbers, um, part of the thing with millennials job hopping is – a theory that if you stay at a job more than five years, you're losing money. Um, you can move somewhere else and make more. Um, and so, yes, you could have had a couple of opportunities to make more money, but by staying where you're at and maintaining that stability while I go to school, um, and, and this is the key here, I think that it's a fairly safe bet. Once I get out and I start working again, we will have at least met, if not be making more. And it's that, that decision about, it, it's not just about leaving your job. It's about mm -hmm. making the best financial decision that you can for the environment that we're in. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think I've made a good decision. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not upset about my decision, but I am. I am kind of an outlier in yeah. this. <clears throat> well, and I guess the argument I was making was there seemed to be a lot more um, finances. Be damned! I'm going to be loyal to the company that is loyal to me. Oh yeah, and that, you that's know, not even the case. if it means that I'm making less money, I'm going to stay here because they. Uh, I don't know, offer a sick time or I have a steady schedule or, or a pension I'm close to or home retirement or, yeah. or yeah. And a lot of those things are kind of being faded out. I mean, to the minimum that they kind can be, of. which is a shame. <clears throat> yeah. I, I, I think it's, it's nice when you reward loyalty, but uh, I don't think you should expect it. You know? Yeah. And another one, uh, when they get to these jobs that they hop between, they are very much looking for very quick advancement and success. This has actually been a critique that 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 a lot of the boomers have said where where, where they're entitled. They they call them entitled because of it because they want to get in and they they want that raise and that they want to to they not only want the raise quickly but they want to say okay, what's my raise going to look like in three years? What about six years? I want a path. I, I want a road. And on the one hand, I do understand where where somebody who came up in in a, a generation where you you kind of you work hard and you earn it, and then they give it to you because you earned it would would come from that. But in a in an industry where you say, well, in six years my job may be automated, wanting that you know we, we got to hit these steps because I need a reason to yeah. stay. I, I, I can kind of see that. Mike, you're, you're shaking your head here, and, and I, I'd love that, to have yeah, your perspective. That, that mentality drives me crazy. Uh, I'm, I am very much of that generation where <laughs> where you, a raise is something that, that, that you deserve, that, that you have earned. Mm -hmm. And I am all for people earning and, and, and getting with their, their raise. I am not for this idea of we're going to give you a step raise every year. We're going to do this. I, I just – I. So, there, so there, you there miss is, the loyalty, there, there, and you think that people should be loyal to their jobs, but but I think that I I think the reason why you should be lo loyal again I don't think that, I think a job should expect you to be loyal, but I, I I think there's a degree of loyalty that should be honored. Okay, I don't think that that uh, that, that by any stretch that you should be ex you know expected to to give up something, but if you do stay with a job, I think the job should reward you for it. But again. I, I, I think you should earn it. I don't. I'm against collective bargaining too, for the same reason. I don't like the idea of, of, you know, I work my ass off and somebody else doesn't. We're all going to get the same pay raise. Yeah. I just, I, I like the individuality of things, yeah. and it drives me crazy when everybody gets lumped together. Well, and and I guess my thing is there seemed to be for a long time a. Um an environment where a company expected you to come in and be loyal to them um, without any sort of tit for tat. We expect you to come in and work for us. And if you do a good enough job for us, then we'll reward you. As opposed to a an upfront and honest transaction in which we say, I'll be loyal to you. But you won't. If, and they, and, but, but, but they but they don't be loyal. They, they are not loyal. That, that, they that's aren't just rewarded. It. Well, no, but but now look, listen. You you just said that if they come out and say, "I'm going to give you this step raise every year," then then we'll be loyal. But you're not because you've got these businesses that say that I'm going to pay you this much every year. I'm going to give you this increase, and they still leave. Nobody's saying that. Well, that that's a that, thing that's that is ceasing to exist now. Well, I I think it is. I think you're right. Yeah, and well, and what I'm saying is but, that these. The new idea in, in the workforce is I will exchange my loyalty for you if you will give me a reason to be loyal. But they're not they're, but, but, but they're not making they're not doing that. You have companies that are promising that I'm going to give you this, this raise at one year, I'm going to pay you this much at two, I'm going to give you this bonus at three, and people are still leaving. So why would a business why would a business do that if they're not getting anything back? They're not getting All the, the research back. that I'm showing is is that those job, those companies, those arrangements aren't existing. That's not a thing that exists anymore. Sure, they are. They exist all over the place. You get cost of living wage or cost of living raises at most. That's still a raise. That, that, uh, that, that, it's no, not. It, no, it absolutely is because the the business does, is not required to do it to you. Now you might not call it a raise because it's not it's not really more money for you. But for the management, if you're looking at management size, they are spending. Well, more let me money. ask you another question. They, then you said because the business is required to do it, the business isn't required to not cut your pay either. So would not cutting your pay be a raise? No, but it's not the same thing at all. It, How? It, it just it's it be, 
it's their money and they get to make that decision right yeah, they I get agree to with that. make that decision that. and that's what drives me crazy is this idea of 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 an entitlement there now again but it's my time i think it is which is why i think you have the right to go wherever you want to and you shouldn't be punished for it i just don't think that it's good for you to 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 say to expect to get that every time if you're doing a shitty job or you're doing even if you're just doing an adequate job i'm not going to give you the same raise (laughs) that i'm giving somebody that's doing a bang-up job Mm -hmm. let me ask you know i've contracted with you i promised you this raise at at the end of one year well at the end of one year you're you're doing a a, a good job and your buddy over there is not doing such a good job but you know i don't have the extra money i've got i've got to give you both the same raise because that's what i have budgeted or you let go of the one that's not doing a good job well but then you got to replace them with somebody that body and you've got retraining costs even doing a poor job maybe they're doing a good enough job to make me some money but they're not doing a good enough job to get a raise. But but you, but you mentioned retraining co- cost. Yeah. And you said that that they shouldn't expect that raise because it's their money. It is. And, their and, money. and you said it's my time, right? Yeah. You said that's equal. So should a company, if if I'm employed with them, expect me to come in on Thursday? Of course. Why? Because they hired you under contract for the it's, job of it's, doing that. It's my time, and. It, it's not the same the same thing at all. There, there, I don't under, understand how you're drawing any comparison there. Because if the expectation used to be that if I was going to leave, I'd give two weeks notice, I'd do all these things for the benefit of the company. And I think it should still be there, but yeah. But it's my time, and I don't know why they have these, these entitled expectations that I would do that. <coughs> I'll just go apply for another job, and I just won't come in on Thursday. And that's their problem, and and it was my time, and I should have done that. Now, that that's problematic for for for, for the company, right? Yeah. And, and the problematic part for the the people is this real ambiguity of well, am am, am is there going to be any advancement? Yeah. And and I think there's a tit for tat there that needs to happen. I think that I think that a, that a responsible business will do things. We'll, yeah. we'll reward you for your for, you know if you do a good job, we're going to reward you. I think in a responsible business, if I'm a manager and I'm rewarding you for doing a good job, you will stay with me. That's the way things should work. If I do a shitty job and don't reward you, yeah, you're going to leave. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and that's fine. I agree. I agree. But it, I, I don't understand. That, but I don't think there's any point where where I should have to sign a contract saying that I'm going to give you a pay raise next year because maybe the business model doesn't allow it, or or you're you're a shitty worker, or 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 you're just you're an adequate worker. You know what? You have done enough work to pay this salary and I can keep you with that but you've not done enough work for me to give you a 10% pay raise or but, whatever pay raise but isn't that the other side <coughs> the the automatic raise isn't that the other side of a non compete like I signed a contract that I'm not going to work for for your partner for the next year right I, I just why would I sign that contract maybe your partner pays more maybe they're a better payer then, then you don't sign the contract right and you exactly. don't take the job yeah I don't take the job yeah. but if they want me as an employer then they better sign the contract if well, again, yeah, if, if, yeah. if you can negotiate yeah. that, that's yeah, fine. Yeah. But I, but holding and that's company, all anybody's arguing. But for. holding a company hostage for it is something different. What's hostage? What's mean? holding them hostage? Oh, what's hostage? Well, collective bargaining is holding somebody hostage, where people get to. Oh, absolutely, it is. Uh, absolutely, it is. Okay, uh, so when an entire industry gets together and they say we're not going to do pensions anymore, is that company collective sure bargaining? Sure, it is. Sure it so is. they shouldn't be able to, to do it, that. It, it, it works both ways. It's a problem both ways. It is a not a fair system. It is not a fair system. And I, I, nobody's I, arguing I, for a fair. I am, we're not am, arguing here for am, a fair system. I'm, I'm, or I'm arguing for people to be treated equ- equitably. I'm and fine. What fine. you've got is a system there where I think that if you get a raise, you should earn that raise. And you know, I've been in that position where, where you know, I work work my ass off every year i have you know great results and at the end of the year the the teacher down the road that had shitty results and i get the same pay raise because of collective bargaining we all we're all forced to whenever if we didn't have collective bargaining there's only so much money Mm -hmm. i could have gotten 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 more money and that person didn't deserve a raise or there's been times where i didn't deserve a raise yeah you know Uh, collective anytime you're thinking collectively like this i'm against it i I don't like it i don't like the idea and it drives me absolutely crazy well you've you have completely misinterpreted everything i've been arguing here all i'm arguing is that there is nothing wrong with an individual going into a job interview or or after the job has you know they're discussing whether or not they're going to work together saying in exchange for 
agreeing that I will be loyal to you for five years. I expect a 5% pay raise every year. And again, I think you, I think you're misunderstanding me as well, because I don't have a problem with you going in and you negotiating that. I have a problem with expecting a business to meet that. You know, I, I, I have a real issue with that. And that's what, what's there now is that expectation of that. Now, if, if, if that's what you want and, and that's where you are and, and you and, and that business can come together and reach that agreement, that's great. Knock yeah. yourself out. But the, the expectation drives me crazy. Well, well, let me ask this. From the expectation point, do you have a problem with an – so I, I, I'll tell you a hard stance I took when I was younger. I, I was out of high school. I had been working in some manual labor jobs. And I said this. My entitled self said this. I don't get out of bed for more for less than ten dollars an hour. That was my personal yeah. expectation, and I've seen minimum wage was six fifty back then. Yeah, yeah. and I, I've I've sought jobs based on that. I took one job at less than that, but it had a commission component, and I often made more than ten dollars an hour. So it you know count that how you will, and I've stuck to that. Now ten dollars an hour now seems like a like a, a, a far cry from 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 where I am, but but that was an individual sure. decision I made. Yeah. So if somebody gets up and makes the individual decision, not collective bargaining, and says, I don't go to a job where I can't get at least 5% every three years, whatever their number is, that's fine. Yeah, if, if you if you reach if, if you get together and you reach that agreement, that's fine. Yeah, my problem is, but it's you wrong of it. that individual well, 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 to expect the company to do that. Yes, but but no, but that's your expectation when you're looking for a job. I'm if if yeah. the job doesn't provide that, I'm not then, taking then you it. You don't yeah. take the job. Yeah, exactly. And that's fine, all fine, I'm fine, arguing fine. for. Fine. And, but, and I'm fine with that. I'm I'm that's why I that's why I added the collective bargaining yeah. part onto it. So so let me ask you this. When a hundred million people do that because they see the writing on the wall. That creates a movement within the the workforce. That that's not necessarily collective bargaining. That's just a lot of people with the same idea, right? We all like, why would I do that? Because I know there's not job security. Do you see a difference in when the masses do it individually? Uh, just like the masses may go in and, and want to invest in a certain company individually. Hell, and, I don't. I, I, yeah. I, 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 I don't see it. See it. See a, uh, a difference there, and I and I, I will. I will admit that there's there's issues with this. Yeah. I mean, without a doubt, collective bargaining has done some good things. Yeah. But it's done some bad things too, and and and, and you just got to look at it in that direction. And it, when it comes down to coming up with those raises, it's just always bothered me. That okay. that line has always bothered me, and it, it continues to bother me. Yeah. It just really does. But again, if you come in and make that deal, if you, if you come in and this is my expectation and the boss says, that's great, we're going to do that, that's fine. Yeah. That, okay. That's the deal y'all made. Well, fair enough. Um, but uh, I think we see I think we see a, a clear divide here on, on the generations. I think that's, yeah, I that think, was a real I think it is. interesting conversation. Um, uh, next up, I, I, I want to hit three that, that, have, that, that are really close to each other. Uh, millennials tend to search for meaning and importance in their work. They, they want to know that their, their work is valued and is having an impact. And this kind of gets back to, to what you were talking about, about the craftsman's uh, uh, yeah. change. Yeah. Uh, you know, you might have, talking about the guns, one guy who could make 10 guns a, a, a week. And now you have 10 guys who can make 1,000 guns a week. They're making more guns per person. Each person's making 100 guns now, but they don't feel that yeah. meaning and importance in their work. And and millennials seem to really be searching for that in, in what they do uh, to, to the point that, that uh, we've, we've seen a, a lot of uh, people going out, getting degrees, and turning down high-paying jobs to work at nonprofits and, yeah, and these, these sort of areas. I, I think your numbers are right on that. I don't think it's a millennial thing. I think it's an age thing. I think okay. you could have said the same thing was true in the eighties, you know, in the seventies. When people are when people are of that age, I think that's what they're looking for. And, and that's fair and enough. As you get older, I think you look for stability. Yeah, and 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 th- there's a lot of this stuff where uh, uh, the older generations who are doing these studies aren't remembering what it was like to be a kid. I mean, we see that with that old, be my older people, anyway. right? That would be my thought. Yeah. On it. Um, but. Uh, I, I found that interesting and, and maybe relevant to, to this conversation. Uh, very connected to that, uh, they're looking for independence. So they want to be able to pick a project and work on it and have some say in the direction of, of 
the company and and feel yeah. like their input is is taken. Uh, very similar idea, but but less about uh, uh, meaning uh, meaning externally and more about meaning to the organization. Sure, sure. I th I, and, and I think you see that a lot, particularly with dot coms and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the, the the last one that, that's connected to that is a life work balance that they want time to do personal projects, whether it's stuff like this pro this podcast, whether they they want to go work at the local animal shelter, or whether they want to spend time with their kids while their kids grow up. Uh, they're really looking for life work balance in their life. Yeah, and I think that is something different. Um, you know, we've we've heard that talked about before, but uh, particularly my parents' generation and, and and grandparents' generation, they they didn't look for that. They their their life was their work. Uh, yeah, I mean, there was this whole generation called the silent generation yeah, because yeah. they they buried in their work. Yeah, you know? yeah. So I, I would agree with that one. Yeah. Uh, interesting. I've, I've kind of had a, a run in with this one myself where uh, I was in a job interview. That, there was a few stumbles along the interview, but for the most part, the interview went really well. And uh, I'd read through their their kind of uh, planks on their, their website about this. this is going to be a slight pay raise, but it's going to be more travel. So I was kind of torn. It was also going to be less international travel, but... But more domestic travel, so I, I wasn't super excited about it. But I was, I was, I was willing to to kind of shop around. And uh, they came to the end of the interview, and they said, "Well, is there anything you you want to know from us? You know, and open forum to hang yourself, right?" And uh, I said, "Well, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm looking at your your policies here, and I, I see you on number you know seventeen that that you promote a, a good life work balance for your employees. And I want to know what does that mean? What do you do to promote a good life work balance for your employees? What uh, you know or what does that mean? And it was a really important thing for me at the time because I, I have a job that has a really good work life balance. And it was it was funny because it was one of those things they had written in their policy. But you could hear the tone change in the interview. It was something they had probably written in to attract people, but had never thought about, like, what does that mean? And they were like, well, we, uh, we, we, we try and have backup people so that if, if something happens, we can bring someone else in. But I, I think that, that that turning point in the interview is probably the place where, where I lost them, where, where I was actually asking about this thing being important to me. And uh, it, it was kind of you know, almost revealing to me about the way they thought about things versus the way I was, I was thinking about you know, my time. Yeah, yeah. Um, the last, the, the last one, I, I found this uh, paradoxical. Uh, they tend to be technology adopters, which is is kind of like uh, tying the the knot for your own noose. You, you know, you think about it in this whole conversation. They really, when new technology comes out, they they're quick to to come in and and, and incorporate it into the work they're doing. Who are the people that survive the revolutions of technology? It's the people who embrace it learn how to work with it sure. instead of working against it and learn how to take the next steps past it. Yeah. Those are the people. So ad adopting the new technology is the best thing, one of, one of the best things that you can do to survive. Well, I, I kind of uh, akin it to the, uh, the um, Black Friday stampede, right? Everybody's trying to get to the new to 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 the deal because there's three TVs and they all want the TV. Now they've actually created a very dangerous situation, but the person who stays there and doesn't run the stampede, they're not going to get the, the deal. So there's kind of this push of like, well, I think I can beat these other seven people to the TVs, and they end up creating a problem for themselves when Grandma gets run over by the reindeers. Reindeer. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so it, it's kind of like. We all think we can beat the person next to us, so we're all going to run forward full speed. But at the end, we're 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 kind of creating the stampede that's going to run over the eighty percent in the back, you know. Um, and and I thought that was interesting. Um, going into that, I want to talk about uh, how this is probably going to affect the economy because a lot of people have have worries about uh, this turning into a dystopian future, right? If people don't have jobs, then how can they earn money to to buy things? And if people don't work twelve hours a day, how will they earn money to buy things? Well, and and I think you make a point, but uh, at some point in the exponential growth curve, maybe you work twelve hours, then you work eight hours, then you work four hours, then you work two hours, then you work one hours, then you work five minutes, and you say, "Why are we wasting time on your five minutes every day?" 
And and work has kind of become the the main wealth distribution system of of humans, right? We go, we work, we get this thing called money. It's it's a note on some paper, and we give it in, and we get products for it, whether it's uh, air conditioners or food or houses. Um, I'm going to argue that while I don't know what the future economy uh, comes to, that that we're going to have to make some adjustments in, in what that means. Because even if we do eliminate all the expensive human components of, a, of an industry, making air conditioners when nobody can afford an air conditioner is a, a, a wasteful task. You're going to put them in a warehouse somewhere? I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, they, they ran into this problem in, in Europe uh, years ago. Uh, yeah. and, and, and France's solution was the six-hour workday. Uh, you know, and, and, and the idea was by going to a six-hour workday, creating overtime at, yeah. at, 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 what, 30 hours, something like that. Uh, what they did is they, they were able to get more people employed over a longer, you know, everybody worked a little less, but everybody kept, everybody yeah. kept a job. And it, it may be something like that. Uh, uh, we go to a four- or three-hour workday, whatever that means. But at, at some point, if you're producing air conditioners and nobody's buying air conditioners, you you run out of money to even run the machines, yeah, yeah. you know. I mean, yeah. and, and 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 that becomes a futile task for both industry and consumer. Nobody's happy at that point, you know. Um, yeah. um I maybe I am not forward thinking enough, but I suspect that what we will actually see is the type of work changes. I don't think work goes away because I think that is part of how we cope with the human condition and our utter unimportance in everything yeah. Yeah. is we have to have that distraction. And I think, yeah, I don't think we will find a way to distract ourselves from it. It may look more like what traditional work did. It may look more like art. It may look more like uh, maybe a podcast I, here. I, I think work changes, but I think work becomes less uh, and, and, and probably and, and, and you know uh, because that's that's been we've the tradition. seen that as we yeah. have we've uh, gone from, from yeah. 12 hour days to 10 hour days to eight hour exactly. days and that's that's kind of what i you know and it, it, it's just a guess but that would be uh that'd be what i would expect to happen you know it's so foreign to me because i've worked some 12 hour days before i had a job where i worked 12 hours now it was four days on and four days off so i mean that was Those nice were so nice but um I've grown up in a society where eight-hour workdays is just what you do. Standard, it's just, yeah. Yeah. And I can't imagine a um, six-hour, four-hour workday, but I can't really imagine a 12-hour, um, a six, seven days a week workday for, for children even, because that was the yeah. norm. Chil th there were children laborers. I can't imagine that kind of work system anymore either. Now, I know there are people that work in uh, usually blue-collar industries that work those kind of hours, but they get huge compensation over time. The, the, you know, if, if you consider their education a pay level, they're doing, like, really well, and, and, and it kind of balances out on that scale. Uh, but just for the normal, everyday Joe Nobody, that's kind of a hard thing to imagine. But looking at history, I think you're right. I think the numbers play out. Yeah, I think so, too. I think so. Well, and you say you have a hard time imagining that, um, but I would argue that you work 12 hours a day. Oh, yeah, yeah. No less than 12 hours a day. Yeah, whether um, it's the party or the, here. Or, yeah, yeah, there's work that you are not getting paid for um, that you are choosing to do because you you get paid in some other non-monetary way. Um, yeah. But it's not leisure activity. Yeah. It's not rest and it's not sustenance. But um, you are still working. And so I would argue you have some concept of that. Yeah, but but you're right. And and, and I'm, I'm working for the meaning I derive, whether it's the show or the party or whatever, from that. I mean, that, that gets back to this, this search for meaning kind of thing. But I guess that what I'm trying to say is I can't imagine only selling. Right six to four hours of my labor a day and retaining the rest and being able to live at the living situation I'm used to living at for selling eight hours of my labor a day, I guess would be a more accurate way of saying that. I tell you, whenever I, uh, when I taught summer school and college, uh, you know, I, in the summers I'd get up and I taught uh, one class a day for two hours 
That's a good life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it is. Yeah. <laughs> work at, work at eight to 10 in the morning was a good life. I'm telling yeah. you. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and I would argue that you are selling, um, all of that time. You are selling some of your time for monetary gain. You're selling some of your time for, um, personal skills development, development. You're selling some of your Investing time. Investing that time, I would say. Fine. Um, you're selling some of your time for um, reputation gain. Yeah. There is is so much else that you're getting paid with. Um, podcast air quotes. Yes, podcast air quotes. Um, there's There are so many other ways that you're getting paid. There's only one that you do for about eight hours a day where you are exchanging your time for money. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I think that's right. And I... I and maybe we see ourselves go to an economy that is um, doesn't use money at all. Maybe all of the work that we do sexual favors, sexual favors. That's it the new economy. To go there. <laughs> it had to go there. But maybe the work that we do um, is not in exchange for money anymore. And and I think this is a, a far fetched idea. I think we will have something. Um, but maybe it is reputation that we. Um, exchange, or maybe it is, um, you know, time, someone else's time being dedicated to you. Um, I'll maybe help you with this. You help me with that. Yeah. Maybe we're, we, back, we're back to sexual favors. Yes, may, yeah. absolutely. Maybe instead of in dollars and cents, we are getting paid in hours and minutes. Yeah, maybe. So. I, I'm going to stab you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think there's. So new. I think there's been some interesting She's ideas. Been giving right me a stinky here. eye the whole the whole show. So I know the anger is I'm dripping you, off. I'm her. telling you, if you are only listening, you really need to watch on YouTube so you can just. I see. wasn't sure she wasn't going to come over here and throttle me there for a little while. She has while. scissors now. She is. Yeah. She's progressed. Yeah, I heard like a steaming pot yeah, was, in my <laughs> headphones the whole time. I didn't know if that was a paper <laughs> producer to hear, but. Oh. Uh, All right. Uh, I think we I think we've pretty well kind of covered this. I, th I think it's a developing story, and we're so. gonna have It'll to see how. It's uh, it's I been fun. Really My head you. hurts now, though. Yeah. It's, this this is this is. I think Anna might have poisoned me. I'm not sure. Let me ask you. From you were done with your beer by the time I got mad at you. <laughs> <laughs> from a historical perspective, is there um is there anything that you saw through history that came up to here that you think is gonna add? That you can add to our knowledge of, on your prediction on where we're going to go forward. The only thing that I that, that I would say, and I've kind of already already mentioned this, is I think that that history shows us that, uh, that 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 labor is always going to be there. It's going to shift, and it's going to become less of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 what'll happen more than likely is we'll work less, and we'll work less for roughly the same amount of capital payment because it has to be. You know. Uh, Think about the Industrial Revolution when people said, I want to work 25% less and be paid the same amount of money. Mm -hmm. Well, they did. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's what will happen. And I think it has to happen because, uh, as you pointed out earlier, John, there has to be money to buy that, that, that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can't cut everybody's wages back and, and have, no, have nobody to purchase. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing you can do, and the, the only other option, and it's a scary one, is the imperial option. Where, where you go through and you say, uh, you know, our people aren't going to work as hard and they, they, they can't purchase it, oh, but yeah. other places can purchase it and you can, you, you can spread the economy at, at, at gunpoint. Mm. And we've done that before too. Ask, to ask the Hawaii what they think about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Interesting. You know, that, that's always a possibility. I hope that's not where it comes. And fuck France for what they did to Haiti. I learned a bit about that the other day. And yeah. I'm, I'm still stuck on that. Ma made you angry? Yeah. Fuck France for what they did to Haiti. All right. I think we're about ready to wrap up. There's there's one more thing we need to do, uh, and that's recommend a uh, another channel or podcast that, that we want to do. I actually have a, a recommendation this week, if y'all don't mind good, me taking good, over I'm again. Sitting, I'm sitting here looking, going, I haven't picked one. I, I've got a bunch. Yeah. I, I, mine was just going to be a series if yeah. I had to pull something out of my ass. Okay, so I got one, I'll and I think it, it applies really well to what we were talking about here. New economies, old economies, and all that. This sexy YouTube channel, it's not a podcast, but I love this one. Uh, it doesn't come out in a regular interval, um, and, and it's understandable why. It's called How to Make Everything. Oh, this yeah. guy goes through... And it, I'll tell you the recent one. It was it was to do with the NFL because the Super Bowl's uh, uh, on the day we're recording this. 
uh, he went through and he said, it's called a pig skin. How do you make a football? <laughs> he goes through, he slaughters a pig. He used the original pig bladder, which is the way they did it back <laughs> in the day. And he makes a football from leather and pig bladder. He's made a telescope with glass that he went and harvested the chemicals and minerals, made glass, made made a, a lens, and, and did everything. Made it so, to green. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it didn't turn out well. Some of his turned out well. He, he made a suit. He made like a $20,000 suit. He went and harvested the wool. He, he made it into string. This guy makes everything from scratch and and i really love you get to learn a lot about science is that and a youtube channel it's mm -hmm. a youtube channel yeah. and uh but you you also get to learn a lot about where the stuff you use every day came from and how it used to be made in the older economies before the industrial revolution so yeah, yeah. that's Sounds my promotion good. this Sounds week good. super cool all right so if you like what we're doing here there are ways that you can help us out john what would that be you can go to patreon.com slash six pack philosophy there we have a bunch of listener perks for anyone who wants to become a patron and give a uh, small monthly donation uh, we are listener funded so we appreciate anything you can give uh, if merch, it can even be one time it doesn't have to be monthly yeah if, if and if if one time is your thing and you do like merch we do have a shop at teespring.com slash six pack philosophy where you can go buy shirts koozies uh, wall prints all your six pack philosophy branded merchandise how much will you sell six pack fill for oh that's gonna be expensive $25. $25. <laughs> you can have six-pack fill. All right. <laughs> and uh, I'll the, even secure his, his toga and make it out of something that's not toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> I think toilet paper is really what drives it home. Uh, and, and the very last thing you can do to help us is like our podcast, if you do, because it, it lets everybody else know that, that we do have quality content that you can share about. And if you have any friends you think might be interested, help us find them because uh, – we're, we're trying to, to spread uh, philosophical ideas to modern problems, and uh, this only works if we all get out there and, and work together. So Sounds good. Awesome possum. Let's go. All right. Cheers. 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 Six Pack Philosophy is supported by independent philosophers just like you. If you would like to support us, go to sixpackphilosophy.com, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. 